This is where the wicks are pre-waxed for the church candles, which are made in the beeswax department. And when the wax is dried, the wicks are cut off the drum. Now they will be trimmed down to the correct lengths to suit the larger church candles and sent on their way to the beeswax department wrapped in brown paper. Chandler. That's a translation from the Latin word Candelarius. Chandler, the man who makes or sells candles. It's also used by the grocer who sells small wares as well. We're now in the beeswax department. Of course, beeswax candles are for the church. For mystical reasons, the Roman Catholic Church insists on beeswax candles for mass and other occasions. Bobby Lapla is in charge of this department. The carousel is like a chandelier in reverse. The wicks are hung instead of standing up straight, as they will when they have become candles. Bobby Lapla is a highly skilled operator. But of course Bobby's at this since he left school, since he was a chiseler. His father before him was a candle maker. The dipping starts. Down they go and up they come, a little thicker. And down and up they keep going getting thicker and thicker and thicker. The wax in this pan is a little cooler than its neighbour because the surface area of the candle is less. The calipers are taken out to check the dimensions. Bobby must use them constantly to ensure each candle is the same size in diameter. The candles are very flexible at this stage, for all the world like joint strands of spaghetti. They're laid on a marble slab and hand rolled into shape. Then they're trimmed. And when the rolling and trimming is done, they are reversed and hung up again for more dipping. Candles have been used for thousands of years. Socketed candelabra were discovered in the volcanic ash of Pompeii in Italy, which was destroyed 79 years before the birth of Christ. In the ancient Irish authorities, the Sancus Mor tells of candles of eight fists, about 40 inches long, made by repeated dipping of peeled rushes into tallow or meat grease. Sure, where would we be without candles? What would the clergy do for the 40 hours adoration if we hadn't a candle? And when you go to get your throat blessed on the Feast of St. Blaise, Candlemas Day, the 2nd of February, don't they do the blessing with two candles? Bobby is tipping the candles. It's hard physical work and a warm job with added heat from the pans of molten wax. Do you remember all those lovely processions torchlight processions that the Oblate Fathers had at the Inchicore Grotto and all the thousands of paper lanterns all different colours with little candles and the lights swaying to and fro and when you look back at the procession it was like a long road of hope shining in the darkness (laughs) 
This is a very ancient method of making candles and has been going on in Dublin for almost 500 years. Hand casting Paschal candles. First the wick has to be waxed and stretched. The reason for this is to get the wick well impregnated with wax and also when the wax is poured over it, it will flow down it nicely and smoothly. I don't like all those electric light shrines in some churches. You know, nine out of ten times when you push the button, your light doesn't come on. And it's sort of like being shut down with your intention before you start. Now, that could never happen with a candle. Ah, it might flicker and go out, but you can always dip it in again and light it. And then, you know, after you've left the church, the old candle is burning away there, plugging in your request. If they don't get rid of those electric shrines and get back to the burning candle, there's a danger that in the future they'll have us renouncing the devil with a flash lamp. I wonder how long it'll take that candle to burn out. 1981? 82? Will it be still there? in 1985. A joint candle, Kinyal Henri, or the King's Candle, as it used to be called in the old days. It stood lighting outside the King's tent at Tara. In fact, the man who held the candle was called the Light Holder. And anybody by the name of Light Holder today, well, that's what your ancestors held. I'll say one thing for your ancestors. They must have been very big men. A candle like this one was made for the visit of Pope John Paul to Ireland. It has to be cast upright in a special mould. We're now in Jack McCann's sanctum, the testing department. Uh, Mr. McCann, this is the um, 313 wick. It's a 313 German yes. wick. And uh, that's the old wick. That's the old one there. They're not too bad at comparing them, each one against, one against the other. No, there seems to be a bigger flame after the new wick we're having yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And the well doesn't seem to be quite as big on that one as it is on that one. No, no, but, but it is, uh, is uh, it's burning, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, it's burning quite well, already. Right? You'd want to leave it for a while just to see. We come back to it in about a half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and see it's flickering a bit, isn't yes. it? Yes. So if you close over that door, Bob. Yes. There you are now. You didn't know the candles were tested. To ensure that the wicks are burning... True and bright. And now packaging and final preparation. The fluting at the end gives a self-fit. No trimming needed to get the candle into the candlestick. Shrine candles, perhaps on their way to White Friar Street Church or John's Lane. Packed with care by Helen Kyle. Household candles, 
coloured candles, large candles, small candles, yule logs, altar candles, all on their way to brighten the world. What John Ratbone started in 1488, still going strong in Dublin. Well, that's the candle story. And before I leave you now, in case you're alone tonight, or you're worried about something, as me mother used to say, don't be worrying. On me way home, I light a candle for you. And I will, you know. <laughs> 